Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the opening session of the New News Festival, which is an annual festival run by the Centre for Advancing Journalism, in which we talk about the present, a little bit about the past, but mostly about the future of journalism. Um, it's a festival which is aimed not at academics and not even at the industry, but to the people who matter most to journalism, which is you, the audience, the people, the citizens who are most concerned with what journalists do. Um, I'd like to announce this is obviously run by the Centre for Advancing Journalism, of which I'm the director. My name's Margaret Simons, in partnership with the Wheeler Centre, and our principal supporter is Swinburne University. You can find more information about our sponsors up at the back. Now, in this opening session every year, we try to take the temperature of the news media industry. We try and look at what issues have mattered most since we last met, since the last new news, and what's likely to matter in the year ahead. And to help me to um, dig into those issues, we have on our panel, if I start at the, my far left, Emily Wilson, who is Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian in Australia, which is in itself one of the significant developments in recent times in journalism in Australia. Emily joined The Guardian 14 years ago, and she's worked as health editor, science section editor, features editor, news section editor, and most recently, before her current job, network editor of the UK edition of The Guardian's website. And then immediately to her right, we have Mark Forbes, who is news director of The Age. He's responsible for all content across seven days in print, online, iPad, and mobile. So he basically leads the newsroom and is second in command to the editor-in-chief, Andrew Holden. And then to his right, we have Kate Tourney, who is Director of News at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and she's had a very long career as a broadcast rep reporter, producer, bureau chief, executive producer, and editor. And then immediately to my left, we have Damon Johnson, who's been editor of the Herald Sun since July 2012. Before that, he was editor of the Sunday Herald Sun, and he held that position since November 2008, and he's had a long career um, in different positions with News Corporation newspapers. So what I've asked them to do in order to kick us off is to each just reflect briefly on what they think the main issues affecting journalism have been over the last year and what the challenges and issues will be in the year ahead. Then we're going to have a little bit of discussion among ourselves and there will be plenty of time for your questions at the end. Damon, would you like to kick off Sure, mm. why not? Look, um, in recent years, there's been a lot of people, some within the industry, who have been too willing uh, to talk journalism down, uh, newspapers specifically, notwithstanding the uh, seismic forces that are at play within all of our worlds, not least uh, the newspaper world. I can't think of a better time to be a journalist. I don't know whether there's any aspiring journalists out there. But the advent of new technology, smartphones, uh, video... Uh, that has allowed newspapers, such as my own and Mark's, to transform into 24-7 multimedia publishers. It's just been an absolute boon for journalism. Um, barely a minute would go by anywhere in the world where there's not a news corporation reporter breaking a story on Twitter, any of the other social media sites, Facebook, um, our websites, all of these types of platforms. Our iPad app, which we've just relaunched, I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, it wasn't that long ago when I was Chief of Staff of the Herald Sun, uh, in a role a bit like Mark's, that um, we would get a good story at, say, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and we'd sit and wait and wait and wait to get knocked off by the television stations at 6 o'clock, um, or the radio bulletins, or Neil Mitchell, or John Fain, or any of the ABC outlets, and uh, it was inherently frustrating, I can tell you that. Um, the anguished cry from a reporter that would go up in the newsroom, having endured and had their scoop survive Fane, Mitchell, the Bulletins, Ernie Sigley on 3AW, <laughs> to then get knocked off by Brendan Donoghue at the 6 o'clock news. You know, it, I can't tell you how frustrating that is. Um, that no longer happens, you know. Uh, newspapers across the world are making real life, uh, real live decisions as to what we publish, when we publish it and how we publish it. Um, you know, the editing structure of a newspaper is now such that, you know, the editor or the editor-in-chief of the day sets the kind of rules, the broad rules of engagement, 
uh, I guess, drives the culture and the values. And then these various editors who run the website, um, the social media accounts, etc., and, and individual reporters um, are empowered to then make those decisions to publish themselves. Um, now, obviously, being first isn't the only obligation. We have to be uh, accurate as well. Uh, and there is intense pressure to be first, but not at the expense of accuracy. So, look, I think um, 2014 is an amazing time to be a reporter, in particular, and be an editor. Uh, at the Herald Sun, I'd mentioned we just relaunched our iPad app. It's the third iteration of it. It's still going through some teething issues, but functionality-wise, it's very good. Um, and, you know, the numbers are fairly small in relative terms when you like uh, stack it up against newspaper circulation, for instance. But it is the future. Um, not to say that newspapers don't have a future. You know, we believe that the Herald Sun will be around in print form uh, for many, many, many years to come, if not decades. Um, our job is to stabilise the print edition of the Herald Sun um, whilst building a profitable digital future. And, you know, we have something like 50 or 60,000 people who pay each week to read our content on a digital platform. So again, those numbers are relatively small compared to the print edition, um, and the revenues are relatively small. However, uh, you know, you've got to start somewhere, and the 10-year uh, free trial for uh, news ended a few years ago when we started charging, as, as it should have. People should pay for their content if it's content that they want to pay for and they value, and that's our job, is to provide that. So uh, that would be my observation of where the news media is at, as far as I can tell. Well, plenty of things to pick up there on in question time, Damon, but I'm going to go straight to Kate, given well, that Emily doesn't want to go... At point, we're going to be in furious agreement, which is un unusual. Um, but <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I just think it's the most extraordinary time for journalists, and I think it's the most extraordinary time. I, I'm, Kate, you know, can you just pull your microphone sure. in a bit? Yeah. I clearly um, uh, come from a broadcast background, and... Um, a similar sort of scenario to Damon in that, you know, when I was a reporter, um, I would go out as a television journalist and if, you know, I was uh, at a court and I was reporting a verdict that came down at 11 o'clock, I would have time to craft that story for a 7pm audience. And it seems extraordinary to me to think that at the ABC only five years ago, we were delivering two 30-minute bulletins, television bulletins, uh, to Australian audiences every day. Five years later, we produce 24-hour uh, news and we produce that across every single platform. Um, and the important point about that is that, that, just like my colleagues, we've had to find ways of doing that without additional funding. We've had to really think about how do you change your workflow, how do you change the way your reporters think about filing to ensure that you're serving all audiences. And when I think about the year that has just passed, I have a 16-year-old daughter, and I look at her news consumption, and um, it doesn't include any scheduled radio or television news. And yet she probably consumes more news than I did when I was 16. And it's incredibly varied, it's interesting, and it's from a range of different sources. So one of the biggest challenges, I think, for all four of us is to think about how our brand is important to that generation. We have a, an obligation, and, and I think my role is a little bit different to the roles of others on the panel. I'm a public broadcaster. Uh, we exist to serve the public and to remain relevant and valued to the public. And so my role is not only to serve you on a daily basis, the news that you need uh, and you want, but it's also to think about how the ABC is going to remain valuable to audiences in five and ten years' time. So for us, it's about um, you know maintaining that uh, that loyalty with audiences. 7.7 .7 million people every week watch our television news programming. Um, around 5 million people listen to ABC News every week. We've got around 3 million people uh, tuning into News 24. They're big audiences. And yet, how do we also make sure that we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, that we are delivering news in a way that is relevant and is going to be shared by audiences who are consuming news in a different way? Um, and that's an incredibly exciting opportunity for news organisations. It's a little daunting, um, but we shouldn't be daunted by it because it's an incredible opportunity. We can now reach audiences who might never 
never otherwise have come to the ABC. So I completely agree with Damon. It's just this amazing time where we have to think laterally. We have to be so careful about the way we use resources. We need to be ensuring that our reporters are thinking about every part of the audience rather than one particular part. And for me, it's about understanding how we take those amazing brands like Australian Story and Four Corners, um, AM, PM, how we take those brands to audiences who might not tune in when we choose to schedule them. Um, and, and I also think it's important to understand that the scheduled audience and the news now or continuous audience um, are not two separate things. You think about how you consume news. You may well tune in to an evening news bulletin, but you also, at various times in the day, want to pick up your mobile phone and you want to know what's going on. So it's a not an either or. It's about understanding that you have a range of different needs um, and we need to ensure that whatever news we're delivering to you has a consistent quality and that we're meeting those needs. Mark. Well, I had to be the first to inject a note of pessimism into uh, the, <laughs> the events of the year. I was thinking everybody was being extraordinarily upbeat. I mean, I, I do look back at, at, at the past 12 months and, and uh, I do see some, some positive but also some worrying signs. I think it's been an appalling year for, uh, for, for media freedom, really. I, I think that uh, we all got a bit of a shock, a shock after the, the uh, Edward Snowden revelations uh, about the extent of uh, metadata being collected... Uh, on uh, people in the community, but I suspect particularly journalists, so all our communications potentially being emails and everything being, being swept up by, by various uh, agencies. We've got um, these new intelligence uh, laws, which I think are a hugely retrograde step. And one of the few times I'm in fulsome agreement with Greg Sheridan um, that, uh, um, that, that, that journalists facing five, ten years jail um, for reporting simply on an intelligence operations because it's seen as being special and, and that ban remains indefinitely no matter what occurred and I'm aware of several occasions in the past where our law enforcement and intelligence agencies have got stuff wrong, have, have, uh, have behaved inappropriately and the idea that this has just passed through, that that will be protected <laughs> for all time, and journalists to be, be jailed is, is abhorrent. I can't believe that we're in this situation, uh, uh, in, in this situation now. And I think generally too, in the terms of accountability of various governments, that that we, we, we are now in a society where it's not even remarked upon that our Navy can't talk about on-water operations. I mean, it's a joke. So I think in, in, that, in that broader context, uh, there's, some, there's some serious worries. But I mean, like, like Kate and, and Damon, I do see a lot to be positive about in terms of the current environment. I mean, we are all now, I think, genuinely um, uh, multi, multi-platform operations and we, we can joust a bit amongst each other about who's ahead here and where, but um, uh, we, we all are and we're all active and we're all experimenting. Um, I think the interesting this year, thing this year has been the uh, resurgence of print um, with a bit of the, the palace coup in, uh, at News just over a year ago where the, the, the print ed sort of... Uh, saw Kim Williams tossed out. We've seen uh, a preeminence of, of print back at news along with their digital initiatives. Um, and at Fairfax, where there's been a recalibration. Um, mm. uh, it took a while for it to be pronounced publicly, but basically from, I think, looking at a limited future for, for print, uh, we're certainly committed to, uh, to print for the foreseeable future. And interestingly, print now is far more profitable for us than it has been at any time in the past uh, uh, in the past five five years because of efficiencies, co cost cutting, uh, changes in distribution and, uh, uh, and, and so on. Mm. I suppose the other things that I'd see happening uh, is uh, the, the, the new players, particularly the international players gaining ground. I think we've now seen uh, The Guardian and uh, you know, the Daily Mail uh, establishing a, a significant foothold here in Australia. I think that uh, the, the quality of, of their broader domestic reporting is debatable, um, uh, but that will change. Um, they're recruiting, they're getting good people on, and, and they're going to be significant uh, uh, competitors. And I suppose that's the other thing that we're all used to now these days is, is, is change as a constant. I think that 
when I moved into management, we were giving a few sort of courses on change management theory and they've stopped doing that. <laughs> they stopped doing it because we went so far past what they said was an acceptable amount of change you could inflict on a workplace that, mm. that you might as well just burn it and, and burn it and, uh, and keep going. But um, we've, you know, even almost a year ago, I think we were all fairly focused on things like uh, our homepages as being the big thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where our brand was. That's what people will come to. It's become very clear this year when you're looking at the trends. Well, no, no, the big, the, the big questions are, 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 are what, are you, what are you doing on mobile? What sort of presence have you got on Facebook? Um, uh, What's your search engine optimization like? That's where the traffic is coming from uh, online now. I mean, last night we had a fantastic uh, uh, international story about a, a secret uh, $7 million payment from an Australian company to the chief executive of Hong Kong. We put that up online, 6 p.m. Would have had, uh, between 6 and, and, uh, and midnight, would have had 80,000 people uh, read it online. 20,000 of those came from Facebook. We had a, another 50,000 people read it on mobile. Those audiences are just uh, are just growing, um, and and uh, are now the, the bulk of our the bulk of our business. Um, mm. So I think for the year to come, um, we'll have more change. We'll have evolving <laughs> evolving business models. We'll have. Uh, uh, searches for those new revenue streams that none of us have quite found to replace the uh, the uh, the rivers of gold, and I'll see. I think we'll see a few shakeups in the landscape mm. potentially with cross media ownership law changes, and uh, I think we'll increasingly see uh, organisations like Google as a as a serious competitor as well, and uh, and start questioning some of their practices as search becomes mm. more important for all of us. Well, it certainly is the fastest changing industry on the planet. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, you mentioned Kim Williams. We'll be hearing from him immediately after this session, of course. And we'll also be picking up on those media freedom issues in another panel over the next couple of days. But Emily, lucky last, as you requested. Obviously, I think it's very unfair to say that the quality of our Australian coverage has been debatable. I think on, on Canberra and on, on the boats, we've not only led the way, but we've changed the national agenda. So obviously, we produce less Australian news because we have three people in Melbourne compared with your 300, and we have sort of 20 in Sydney compared with however many the age. But, um, but more generally, because we're at a different stage in our evolution, my last year, our last year has been really different. We've, been, we've gone from having one person in Australia to having um, 60, including commercial, and so it's a time of rapid growth, establishing ourselves and establishing a new culture, a print-free culture. Um, uh, in England, we still have a newspaper, but here it's been um, really exciting um, not having a newspaper. And we, we all come in and we make one thing every day, and the, the shared sense of mission and purpose and the clarity of structure that allows us is really exciting. Um, as you said, we're not the only um, global organisation to set up an Australian branch. Um, the uh, Daily Mail's already uh, done it as well, and HuffPo coming soon, and now the BBC are coming in hard quite soon. and. What happens with all of us milling around, I think, is going to be really exciting, really interesting to watch. I cannot predict what's going to happen or where it's going to go. But we're still at a state of, I've been here at my desk three months, and I've given out 27 contracts and jobs. And that's, that's the biggest challenge for us right now, is growing, absorbing, and mm. making it still um, a guardian culture. Mm. Thank you. Let me pick up on one of the themes that, that Mark raised. Well, you've all mentioned it in different ways. Money, the ugly business of money. I suspect you're not making a profit yet, Emily. But it's not and the Guardian as, way to make a profit. And as, Mark, <laughs> <laughs> and as Mark and Damon, I think, both alluded to, nobody has yet cracked the nut of making people pay sufficient for content to support the big newsrooms of old. And Kate, you're suffering funding cuts and have just recently been in a bit of a tangle with the Minister for Communications, Malcolm Turnbull, about whether the ABC actually needs all that back office in order to produce the news. How can you keep doing what you do? Well, it's easy for Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she would agree with that. I think, yeah. <laughs> the ABC's not going to go broke. No. Um, Look, are you? No, the look. The Herald Sun is enormously profitable as a as a as a print organisation. Um, we're not. We haven't been immune to the, in you know, the seismic forces that have hit the media industry and all industries by the advent of new technology by any measure. 
um, and circulations are down, um, as they are in probably every newspaper in the world, I would imagine. Um, but look, we firmly believe that the Herald Sun's got a, um, a uh, strong print future in Victoria. Um, we're still selling uh, around 400,000 newspapers Monday to Saturday and I think something like 430-odd on a Sunday. So, um, but how's revenue, Damon? How's revenue? The paper revenue is pretty good. Um, ad revenue, obviously, in the newspaper, the old business model in newspapers, Marx was a bit different because we never had to really survive off classifieds um, because we never really had them to the extent that the Fairfax papers did. So that's been a kind of uh, systemic advantage for us in enduring this. But um, you earn your money through um, people shelling uh, $1.30, $2.20 to buy the Herald Sun, um, making that decision, uh, and through display advertising. So uh, that's essentially how you make your money in, a, in the print. Now, it's much more complex now. Uh, the pressures are on, obviously. Um, you know, the global financial crisis, uh, everyone knows what that did to the retail economy. And obviously, uh, people stopped buying. Uh, the big companies stopped taking as many ads. But Robert Thompson, the CEO, said the other day that there are green shoots on the nullarbor when it came to the ad market. And we, we're seeing that in the size of the paper that I publish. The more ads, the bigger the paper. Um, and if you buy tomorrow's, you'll see that. It's quite a substantial um, paper. It should be 112 pages. Um, and that's off the back of strong ad volumes. Digitally, things are a little less clear. Um, as I said, we've got 50 or 60,000 people that choose to pay for our content online. Now, the value of a digital subscriber isn't, the, at this point, what the value of, the equivalent value of a print subscriber. Um, however, you've got to start somewhere. And uh, I think, um, media companies couldn't keep giving away their content for free. So uh, mm -hmm. at News, we made the decision to start charging them, and it's up to us to make it good enough for people to pay. Well, if I can just turn that to the other um, print media, well, used to be print media company on the stage. Mark, isn't one of the reasons everybody's talking up print again <coughs> because subscriptions haven't actually delivered anything like as much revenue as you would ideally like? Uh, no, online no, subscriptions, uh, I mean. No, uh, our, our subscriptions are trending uh, mm -hmm. above targets, both in revenue and numbers. Then, I mean, we've, and you know, we've, we've actually got a, a bigger digital mm -hmm. audience than, than, say, Damon, where he's got a bigger print audience uh, than, uh, uh, than ours. So that's been quite successful for us, but mm -hmm. it's been a little bit of a fiction that somehow that was then going to. Uh, uh, to address all the revenue revenue issues that we face, I mean, but uh, really, been it's been more of a, we've 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 stopped freebies, giveaways, heavily discounted um, uh, distribution costs aren't as big because we're selling less, um, but we've also um, put up uh, fairly substantially the. Um, the cover price at least 50% or more in the last uh, uh, last 18 months, and people haven't blinked. There, there, mm -hmm. There's basically a a loyal audience out there who like to have uh, uh, like to have their their news delivered in a print form. I mean, my view is our buzzword and most media's buzzwords has been digital first. That's been a bit about cultural change, about mm -hmm. changing attitudes within newsrooms, about being on a 24-hour cycle, but. I, I prefer the term for us now is really being audience first and, and, and looking at the bunch of different audiences we have in different mediums and, and trying to serve them as well as we can. And um, uh, there's, there's simply, on the current figures, no reason to be sounding the death knell for, mm -hmm. for, for print. Uh, certainly in Melbourne, we're, 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 we're doing well and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Herald Sun, uh, Damon's right, is, is mm -hmm. still quite a, a, a very healthy proposition. Now, Kate, what's going to happen to Lake Lyon and, and the state-based 730 report? You're getting rid of them? Sorry, Margaret. Um, our situation is uh, clearly we're, we're facing budget cuts. We're yet to understand what those those cuts are. And um, uh, and Damon, you know... Easy, As Emma easy, Alvarici really. would say, um, you are going to answer the question, <laughs> so, aren't you? No, no. Um, <laughs> Well, we don't know because we simply don't know what those budget cuts are, and and, um, and quite rightly, um, we are looking at back office efficiencies, just as my colleagues will have done as well. So it's always about um, you know content is the last thing you ever want to cut, um, and that's absolutely the case at the ABC, and it's absolutely the case at ABC News. Um, but we are waiting to understand what our budget portfolio, what our budget envelope is. And until we do that, we actually don't know what uh, our content future is. Um, but our situation at ABC News is, you know, as I said before, uh, you know, five years ago, delivering scheduled television news bulletins twice a day to Australian audiences. 
Um, without additional funding, we were able to find efficiencies in back office um, to, to deliver News 24. So News 24 was delivered without additional funding. ABC Online was created without additional funding. Um, now, once we'd done that, uh, the government in 2013 gave us some additional funding to look at, uh, at how we would enhance our original journalism across digital platforms and how we would seek to enhance journalism in regional areas. Um, but it's really important to understand in developing things like iView, like ABC News 24, like ABC uh, uh, News Online, we've done that within our existing budget envelope. So once you lose the capacity to look at back office efficiencies, new ways of gathering news, new ways of, of producing news, technology efficiencies, once you lose the capacity to use that to reinvest in the kinds of services that you want into the future for news. Um, and then we have to look at content cuts to ensure that those reinvestments opportunities are, are still there. Because as I said before, it is terribly important that we deliver um, and continue to del deliver quality programming to audiences who want it on the schedule. But it's very, very important uh, for the ABC to still be relevant in five and ten years' time, that we are thinking about new digital products so that you know the service that we deliver is relevant to a new generation and also to your changing needs as, as, uh, as news consumers. So, Margaret, no decisions have been made in relation to programming and no decisions will be made until we understand what our budget portfolio is. The last thing anyone at, at the ABC wants to do, and certainly anyone in news wants to do, is cut news programming. We know that into the future, news is going to continue to be uh, the backbone of the ABC. And, and we want to make sure that the services that we're delivering are absolutely relevant uh, to audiences now and into the future. So the only program you've quarantined is Peppa Pig, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that for Mark Scott to answer. <laughs> um, now, Emily, you don't charge for access no, to your website. No, um, we don't plan to. So our, How does that Guardian work? Global's owned by a trust and that's got a nest egg, but we can't drain the nest egg, so we do have to make money as well. You're making a good try of it. No, we we have done our best, but however, we do. We're, 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 if we we get to a stage of only losing a certain amount, we're fine forever, mm. type thing. Um, so the new strategy, um, which has only been rolled out in the UK so far, is a membership scheme, and what you get <laughs> for being a member is access mm. to the Guardian, to Guardian journalists, to live events, to mm. debates, talks, all kinds of classes, blah blah blah. Um, and we'll start that here in about a year. What's the worst thing that's happened in journalism this year? What's the thing that has been the biggest stuff up, the worst disaster? Mm. Well, you'd have to say the execution of journalists in trouble spots around the world, mm. full stop. Mm -hmm. In terms of the performance of the Australian media? Oh. <laughs> you tell us. <laughs> no, 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 you're the panellists. I get to ask the questions. Yeah, that's a that's a blue. We don't we don't hide from that. That's a, an appalling. Blue. So I, I think what but the questioner was ask, was <coughs> talking about was the mm. uh, publication of somebody alleging they were a mm. terrorist when they weren't. Yeah, yeah. Mm. it's not the. I mean, it's not the first time that's that's happened. And I think al almost uh, uh, most outlets have had an experience of, of the wrong photo. It was unfortunate mm. the wrong photo was such a high profile case. Mm. To be frank. Mm. Um, uh, there's, there's lessons in those, and you simply you simply have to have to uh, have to learn from them. There mm. was some procedural failures, and a whole bunch of photos that were verified, and one mm. that wasn't. Uh, but uh, but you can't you can't defend getting to the point where that happens. But I would say, in terms of you know the worst thing that the media has done mm. this year, well, you know, well, that, it, that, do that, you have there's, a competing there's, there's nomination? No, there's no there's no sort of uh, there's no ill intent there. There's no evil agenda. Um, it's uh, it's 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 a blow. I suppose in generally. I mean, I don't look at the look at the uh, the, the media year and think that the media has done uh, an appalling job. I think on the mm -hmm. whole, the issues that should be being chased uh, are being chased and are being are being questioned. You can wonder about when when um, issues get out there and run, whether they're terror or other related, whether there is mm -hmm. uh, enough 
uh, critical uh, and calm analysis, but uh, we're we're all operating on a 24-7 cycle and uh, mm. you're responding to events and raids and so on when mm. they happen. Well, that's the other issue as well, which I suspect will come up in questions. Um, I did think that the day, the, the, the Sydney cycle. siege day, was a bit bats. That was a bit mad. The, the, there was a, a lot of uncritical reporting of, um, you know, a big government show of force a week after it committed troops to... Iraq and people showing pictures of suspects. On the Australian, they had, you know, pi pi you know, people being arrested and show their faces showing and their addresses and their car number plates. And it was a bit of a hysterical day. I don't know if it was the worst day, but it wasn't a great day. I thought. Would you agree with that, Kate? Hysterical. Um, hysterical. Uh, across the board, I think that was one. That was a day whereby the pressure of 24-hour uh, reporting was really evident. And I think similar. Um, you know, I thought Boston, um, well, not this year, that was, a, that was an incredible moment in... Boston bombings was mm. just an incredible moment in journalism. Um, and, uh, you know, a moment whereby we really had to reflect on how, um, as an industry, we are coping with a flood of information um, as in, in terms of our news gathering and, and filtering that and, and, and the assessment process that we, we place around that. And I remember that, that night uh, my uh, deputy ringing me to, to say, you know, look, uh, a number of news organisations that we would normally use as agencies and as trusted sources and naming suspects, we can't actually uh, verify. Um, there's pressure coming from a number of, of uh, EPs in the organisation. Um, and yet we just went, you know, returned to first principles around that. And, and I think in the end, um, you know, we sometimes hear debates around uh, traditional news brands and what's the f future of traditional news brands when in fact you have access to so much information at your fingertips. I think that was a great sort of example. Well, it didn't happen, it didn't work in, with all news organisations. But I think when you return to your first principles and you are strong enough and confident enough as a news organisation to say, we are going to let the audience know that there are a range of things happening, but we are unable, this is what we know, and we are unable to confirm other uh, rumours, but we will let you know uh, as things develop. And I think that's returning to the first principles of journalism. It's not that complex, but the pressure uh, of social media and that flood of information, I think on a number of occasions, it, it does challenge uh, news editors um, and news leaders. Mm. Damon, what's the worst moment in uh, Australian journalism in this last year? And, and I am asking you about the performance of the local industry right. rather than the global issues. Hmm. You know what? I, maybe I'm an optimist. I, I actually can't think of a calamitous um, event. Have there been failures to critique and, 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 and probe? Um, probably. I can't think of any obvious targets or um, things, you know, the media is fairly diverse. If you like left-wing media, there's plenty of that around, guys. If you like a more mainstream... <laughs> <laughs> if you like a more mainstream... He flicked his eyes at you too, Kate. <laughs> if you like a more mainstream, mass, proudly mass market, proudly tabloid approach to news, there's plenty of good news corporation papers you can buy. Or you can buy... <laughs> or, you can, or you can buy the Australian. Yeah, and, and so I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is that whatever your tastes are, and, you know, Australia is full of, ro you know, robust media consumption, and, and, and you, you'll find pretty good journalism in, 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 in both spectrums. Both spectrums will probe and, and interrogate different issues differently, but between all of us, I think pretty much the current government's um, policy is secrecy around boats, um, that's been pretty well interrogated, I think. Um, uh, and I actually think the media in large on that night three weeks ago when Newman Hyder was uh, shot dead by a very brave police officer, I think the media as a whole did a very, very good job that night. Um, we got it right. It wasn't just about being first. Um, the papers were changed for the next day, substantially in the Herald Sun's case. Um, and people engaged on that story because it was in our suburbs. Mm. and they got a good service overall, I think. And that's Damon, true, you just... Sorry. No, I think that's true, but I also mm. think that's an interesting case study of um, transparency. Th uh, that night, there was a, a great deal of transparency and information 
uh, flowing from authorities, which I think mm. was really important. It gave us kind of the context that we required. And I think, I think you know, when we're talking about boats, we're talking about, you know, uh, um, uh, coverage of, of, of terrorism, anti-terrorism, I, I think that's where we're, we're still really struggling and I think that lack of transparency um, is problematic for, for all of us. Yeah, look, we've got a problem with the new legislation yeah. that's come in federally as well. Um, there's a lot of discretion to the uh, DPP of the day, I suspect, mm. who, you know, may not even be in that job yet, who will determine the fate of some future journalist. So, look, news has a problem with that, um, like the other organisations. Mm. Now, Damon, you just um, gestured towards the people on your left and indicated that they were the left-wing media, and you are in the centre. Where's the right-wing media? <laughs> Where's the right-wing media? Maybe the audience are the better judge of that. Um, look... No, is there any right-wing media in Australia? I don't, I don't believe so. I don't believe there's any far-right media. I think there's conservative media. I think there's conservative commentators. I think the Herald Sun, and that's the one I'm educated most, or best to talk about having worked there for so long. I think we fall pretty slap bang in the middle of mainstream Victoria and that's reflected in our sales figures. Um, you know, we, we take a, uh, we are conservative on, on some issues. You know, we um, put the victim of crime ahead of the perpetrator, shamelessly. Um, and there are, you know, these things are core to our values. And I don't think that makes us right wing. I think that just makes us mainstream because I think we reflect the Mm. most of the four or five million people that call Victoria home uh, believe in. You left wing, Kate? No. Um, you know, I, I think this is an ongoing debate, and it will always be, um, because uh, quite rightly, the public feels a sense of ownership about the ABC, and that's absolutely fine with us. Um, I think that of most organi media organisations, we have... Um, an incredibly robust self-regulation uh, uh, um, uh, uh, system and process around, um, around investigating re re complaints, around responding to those complaints. Um, and, you know, as a former EP of Insiders, um, I can tell you that for eight years, uh, I responded in a pretty balanced way to uh, as many complaints uh, in relation to anti-conservative coverage as, as I did on the other side. So, um, you know, quite rightly, I think this is something that for the ABC we will always be accountable um, and we will all, always be answering, um, uh, you know, questions and complaints from the audience in relation to their perception of our coverage. Well, that's good. We've got two people who are banging in the centre here. So, Kate, who's to your left <laughs> and who's to your right? Well, it's not for me to even judge, Margaret. Mark? Where are you? Are you in the centre too? Oh, listen, the, the age has always been and proudly, a, you know, a traditional small L uh, Liberal mm. paper. Uh, and uh, I think we, you know, to a, to a degree reflect, uh, reflect our, our audience and, and their, their interests. Um, Victoria's, you know, in a very different state to, to New South Wales. Mm. I think we were the only state in the last federal election that actually returned... Uh, uh, more votes for the uh, Gillard mm. government uh, than uh, than uh, Tony Abbott's uh, Abbott's Liberals, uh, and you see that change, uh, that that mm. difference. I think uh, reflected in uh, the uh, the respective uh, papers in the respective mm. cities. The Daily Telly, the kind of, you know Damon's sort of sister paper in Sydney, is a very different beast, and I think uh, a, a far less reputable uh, uh, organ of, uh, of any sort of record than, than the Herald Sun, which is still a fine mm. paper. Can go over a bit on, you know, over the top on its sort of favourite issues and they'd probably say the same out of us on, on separate issues. But I think we're, you know, we're, 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 we're to, the, to, the, to the Liberal side of centre, but smaller Liberal, but uh, certainly, you know, some of the, the fanatical talks of, you know, axes of sort of... You know, you know, left wing, close to communism that you see at the frothing at the mouth of uh, of some of the Australian commentators. I just think um, uh, are surreal, really. Emily, where are you? In the middle, the left? Uh, well, we've always called ourselves. Um, which I think in the ancient past, the Age and the Guardian were very quite seen as quite politically the same. We were, you were the Guardian on it. Yeah, anyway, um, uh, I think we get judged on our comments on our comments site mm. and we we do want more right-wing voices there and more debate and that's something we're working on whether there's left or right-wing bias you'll in, be recruiting in Greg news, Sheridan and Chris Kenny and, <laughs> and 
Um, uh, but whether there's left or right wing bias in our news coverage, I think it's much harder to say and much harder to define there. Um, mm -hmm. We try to follow the facts without fear or favour. We try to focus on stuff we don't that we think needs looking at. And do we do? You know, are we? But I, I don't know. It's really hard to say. Mm. Yeah, well, we've got um, two people in the centre and two slightly to the left or something. I don't know. You figure it out. But it is time to throw to you for questions. I think it was Damon mentioned before, um, I've emphasised the importance of being not only, be, um, not only first but accurate. Um, what about being readable? My observation is that um, the quality of written expression has deteriorated quite markedly in the last few years. Um, sentence in, sentences in particular just seem to be getting longer and longer. Um, or is that just me? Well, the the sentences mark. are getting longer. Or well, there's, there's a tendency just to pack as much information into a single sentence. I just well, I guess, um, look, it depends on, look, it depends on what sort of news story... Fairfax what, what, more than the... Uh, the uh, okay, well, I think, I think <laughs> I, we, we proudly, our sentences are much shorter than Mark's. <laughs> um, you know, if we have more than 20 words in a paragraph, it's too long in my view. But look, it, it depends on the vehicle you're reading. You know, if, if you're reading um, a, a breaking news event on on a website, then of course it, it, it's going to be um, very short and very sharp because the intention of breaking that story, or even on Twitter, obviously it's much shorter, is to just get the news out there, make sure it's accurate and get it out there. Um, and then you know, it's more to come. And then you build and you layer up the story, photos, video, whatever. And then of course, you know, there's papers are still great platforms for long form journalism that can run to thousands and thousands of words. So. I'm, I, Sort of struggling to see your point, but I think it just this, the length of sentences is determined on the publication you read and the uh, platform on which you're reading. Is it still the rule in all your outlets that a lead paragraph should be 30 words or less? Uh, no, it's not. We don't have a set rule on that. No, no. You try and keep Damon? it tight. I Look, we, we don't have it. We don't have a set rule, but I, if you can't express yourself in under 30 mm. words, I think um, you should be able mm. to. So I think if. Uh, if you got this morning's Herald Sun, I'll get tomorrow's Herald Sun and uh, count how many words are in each lead paragraph and say the first 10 pages. I think, Marg, you'd probably find that most of them, mm. most of them are under 30 words. Yeah, my students are all going to come gunning for me now. I'm always telling them 30 words or less. The question, next question here. I'd just like the panel to comment on what I feel may well be a dumbing down of serious uh, journalism analysis. And this relates specifically to the fact, because of revenue raising, the emphasis on on digital online uh, reports and as we all know once the digital online reports start running you might as well call it shorthand journalism it tends much more to slogan, slogan journalism and that'll run through the day so I just wonder if there is a problem with the emphasis more and more on digital journalism online journalism because of the revenue side that you're not getting that careful analysis I guess particularly in the in the uh, in the age uh, but also in the Herald Sun which is important for analysis well, given you were specifically yeah. mentioned alternative. I, I mean, and just to, just to be clear, if it's revenue that we make, it, that our revenue is is still uh, coming far more from from the print side and the digital side. Our audience is bigger on the digital side, but but in terms of revenue, it's 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 still uh, it's still larger. Uh, I, I th no, I think that I think that uh, that uh, we've continued to make a, a commitment to uh, to long form uh, long form journalism. We have a daily sort of double spread features page. Uh, we have continued to back very strongly um, uh, the uh, the best investigative team in the country and possibly the world uh, uh, at at the age uh, and. Um, the, st actually, the standard of their writing has actually improved over the last few years to, to a great great degree. They're, they're actually better, generally, better pieces of, of, of writing. I think that we have lost some of our best um, uh, people doing sort of analysis and commentary over time, partly with, I mean, we've, we've, we'd have had uh, uh, lost about 25% of our staff over the last few years. That's a, that's a big loss. We've adjusted for that. but. People who've taken redundancy tend to be the people who've been there for longer and have had a lot more experience than the ones who are like one or two years off retirement. Um, uh, people like Tim Colbatch went because he was due to retire in another two months and he was going to get an awful amount of money just to, uh, uh, to, to walk out the door. I mean, that, that's unfortunate, um, but we're still uh, in the process of, um, uh, of developing and bringing up people 
to, to, to replace that sort of accumulated experience. But I think you still see um, uh, very fine writing in the paper and online. Our focus is more at this stage to actually improve uh, the quality of writing uh, online and so that flows through to print as well. At the moment there's been, I think, still a high attention going on to uh, the quality of the writing in print and we want that to be across all platforms. Damon, do you want to comment on, on that? On the idea, on the policy and analysis and in-depth material? I don't think there's any shortage of um, great analysis and commentary in, a, in any of the tabloid papers around uh, uh, around Australia, you know, we have Andrew Bolt, who I'm sure a lot of you read, um, and you know, if you just look at Andrew as a as a case study, he is a phenomena when you think about his digital audience and his blog, and his ability to shift debate and uh, reflect community opinion and and to be frank, steer community opinion, um, but equally his pieces that appear in the newspaper, um, which are well over, I don't know, 1,500 words probably each, 2,000 words each, twice a week, um, I think are very well written. You can argue, dispute his um, views, and that's not the question I'm answering though, but the quality of his writing I don't think suffers at all from him being a multimedia uh, uh, performer. And I think, you know, we have Laurie Oakes who writes for our, our newspaper on a Saturday, and I think his standard of commentary and insight and writing is about as good as it gets. Um, there's many other examples as well, so I'd, I'd, I'd disagree with that proposition. I think there's something, though, in um, the notion of us having uh, the leadership discipline to slow down um, sometimes. And I, I, I think that's... Um, I think, you know, the, it, the things are so fast-paced, moving quickly. I think there is real need for editorial leaders to actually slow down sometimes and return to issues um, rather than constantly being on a cycle. And I think that does take a real discipline. And I think for us, it's about you know, having those platforms through 7.30, et cetera, radio current affairs uh, programs, to, to not only be covering the issues of the day, but to be returning to those policy issues and debates that really need to happen over the long term. So I, I think there's something in that. And, and it does require some discipline from editorial leaders. Uh, thanks, uh, Meg. Uh, Christopher Kramer from the Centre for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne. Um, it's a question for all members of the panel. Um, I, I just wonder if any of you have uh, reason to believe that uh, uh, SBS and the ABC will be to some degree merged um, within the life of this government and uh, whether or not you think that would be a good or a bad thing. Kate. Sounds like a question to Kate. <laughs> Kate. <laughs> um, I have no inside knowledge of a merger planned, but of course we are also always looking for, for ways of operating effectively and efficiently, and, and that's absolutely been part of uh, you know, the discussion around uh, the Lewis review that was launched earlier this year um, by the Minister, and that was, uh, was looking at, uh, at how we could find efficiencies across the public broadcasters. We've always had an incredibly close relationship with SBS, um, and we're always looking at, uh, for, for ways of cooperating, but I have no inside knowledge about a, a planned uh, merger. Good or bad thing, Damon, for SBS and ABC to merge? Um, I've got a better idea. Um. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what's the better idea? <laughs> I don't see why there shouldn't be limited um, commercials on both networks. We've got SBS, um, which already takes it. And um, look, sure John Fain's ratings are very high. A few of those blind factory ads that 3 w take. I'm not I sure think the Southern would, Cross, um, <laughs> Southern Cross think would, would, would deal would with, with Kate's <laughs> would deal with Kate's um, deal with Kate's revenue uh, uh, problems in one hit. And uh, look, John's a fine broadcaster, and I don't see how that would have any impact at all on his editorial judgment, like it has none on Neil Mitchell's. I, I think um, you should definitely speak to your, your colleagues in the commercial radio and television sector to see if they would welcome that kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of Good or bad thing, Mark? SBS and ABC to merge? Oh, listen, you, you could see it being feasible. Depends uh, depends how it's, uh, how it's done. Um, I suppose just... Uh, the, I mean, there is, when we, when we talk about the ABC, we're a, bit, a little bit conflicted. I mean, I, I used, you know, I worked for Four Corners for a couple of years. Uh, we watched the ABC. Our, our, our audience uh, is also, is loyal to us and loyal to the ABC. Um, and I think it performs a great role. There is a degree of uneasiness when you see the continued expansion uh, that uh, the Kate's talking about and particularly expansion into, place where, into places where there's a bit of a desperate battle for survival going on 
by other commercial players who don't have the benefit of taxpayer funding, and even some of those, um, I mean, you see that uh, I think it's the uh, the New Daily is getting sort of fairly cheap content provided, uh, taxpayer subsidised by the ABC to help fund their their, their websites in in competition with all of ours. You wonder about the even uh, even playing field, uh, to be frank. So I suppose the, the, my question to you would be would be you know wouldn't the debate have been similar? Um, with the advent of radio and television with commercial players. I think that, sh that the notion that the ABC shouldn't be in a digital space, shouldn't be building audiences um, as, as consumption habits are changing, um, is to really suggest that the ABC doesn't have a future. And, um, you know, it's absolutely critical for us to remain viable and, mm. and relevant mm. that, that we are in those digital but spaces. Emily, you Emily, commercial you... commercial deals with particular... With I'm particular just going to bring outlets. in Emily here, Mark. Um, Emily, you've come from the UK, where yeah, the BBC... Exactly. The, BB, the, the BBC is much more dominant in the UK than the yeah, ABC and here, uh, isn't Not it? that you're not good online, but they're really Thank good you. online. Thank and you. But, but online. having, you know, seeing and so SBS... And no one else can charge for content, because everyone can get OK content from the BBC mm. for free, but they're not doing the same kind of investigative journalism, so it's been a huge mm. debate, and the Murdoch family there have been very critical of the BBC online. But what but what they do you think about so coming to a country with a fraction of the population that actually has two yeah. public broadcasters, it, not it one? It is odd. It's unusual. Mm. I can't see why, in theory... The back ends couldn't merge and mm. keep the brown. Uh, uh, mm. You know, the BBC has many, many channels. And um, anyway, but the, the debate around the BBC and its funding is exactly like the debate around mm. the ABC and its funding. Mm. And left wing bias, exactly the same debates. Now we have another question. The gentleman's been waiting for a while. Uh, how much of a threat do you consider political, th uh, political correctness to uh, free discussion in Australia? I really believe really strongly in political correctness. I think it's, it's, it's about being um, respectful to others and about thinking about other people's feelings, other people's lives, other people's situations. So just to take a you know, sort of tiny example, we do, um, we, at The Guardian, we do women, not girls, for grown um, women. And we do people with disabilities, not disabled people, or the disabled. And so I'm, I'm like really into political correctness. What about you, Damon? Well, I, I, I think... Um, <laughs> Not as much, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I, think, I think a robust, mature democracy needs to be able to debate everything from whether the burqa should be worn or whether it shouldn't be. And I think if, if you define political correctness as being a media or a community too afraid or uh, tremulous to debate something like the burqa, and I use that as an example because it's a contemporary debate, I think that's wrong. I think... Uh, regardless of where you sit in that debate, it's good to have the debate. And I think um, the issue of political correctness has, has sort of crept up on us. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good for a, a strong and robust and mature democracy for people to be too afraid to um, risk offending other people by expressing their views. And I think um, political correctness at its worst can inhibit free speech. Um. Do you think there's been an extent of uh, deprofessionalisation within journalism with the recent emphasis on um, citizen journalism and things like audience participation? Emily, do you want to have a go at that one? No, no, no not at all, because people, we've got a, a, a thing called witness where um, people can really easily send us words, pictures, video from scenes, and they send us stuff from Syria and all around the world, and um, it all has to be verified by incredibly highly trained journalists um, who become specialists in verification. So although um, it's an incredibly powerful thing to um, have your audience um, producing news for you, it, um, it really makes more work for um, experienced journalists, not less. Okay. I don't think in any of our newsrooms, uh, I can't dream where, where any of us would say, yes, we think there's been a deep professionalisation. I think from what, uh, from, from what uh, I see is we see uh, increasingly professional and increasingly multi-skilled journalists. The sorts of challenges that, that uh, journalists are facing today and the sorts of familiarity with 
uh, a whole bunch of platforms with, with, with social media, the capacity to be taking your own video and posting that online. Um, there's a whole bunch of skills that people are actually utilising um, uh, e exceptionally well within, you know, the so-called sort of legacy media structures. There's actually been an embracing uh, of all these new avenues to gather information and to distribute information. And, uh, and, and if anything, I'd say I'd see a higher level of professionalism amongst the younger journalists today than when I started in the industry, which is quite some time ago. I really agree with that. Mm -hmm. OK. Look, I, I, I completely agree. But I also think that, um, you know, the content uh, that, that we're getting from our audience now is incredible, incredibly valuable. You know, suddenly stories from the 50 local radio stations that we have around Australia are shared. and. We have a, 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 um, a project called ABC Open, which um, is in regional areas and it's designed to actually uh, teach people how to produce their own videos, produce their own uh, content, and it's all user generated. And they are just beautiful stories that would otherwise not be shared. And yes, there's a bit of effort uh, you know, at the back end to help produce those to a quality that, that uh, you know, the ABC audience would expect, but I think it's an enormous opportunity for all of us to get stories and get access um, to the audience uh, that we've never otherwise had. Damon? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think um, there's been no um, negative impact on quality of journalism at all. It, it just provides us with three or four million other reporters out there who um, <laughs> provide us with tips. Um, that's happened, as long as there's been newspapers, people have rung mm. in or, or um, sent in tips. Um, some of them resulted in very good stories for all our organisations, I have no doubt. You know, now it's the ease with which they can get that material to us, and that's a good thing. Mm. Um, yes, there's verification issues, but um, more often than not, the most valuable uh, information we get from readers is uh, are photos, and the photo, you know, will speak for itself. And um, uh, and it's you'd be surprised at the engagement from Victorians; they want to be part of the news as well. Mm -hmm. So it's good for everyone. Thanks. Would you please thank my panel for turning up um, and taking questions. <laughs>